Welcome, everybody, to this private investor event featuring Alum Scientific. We'll keep this meeting to one hour, and the format will be 15 to 20 minute presentation from the company's CEO, John Valore, followed by a QA session, which Skyler will moderate. If you have any questions, you can feel free to type them directly into the chat box or send us a private message, or you can raise your hand and ask a question when we start the Q&A. About 10 to 15 minutes into questions and answers, we'll also do a quick confidential poll to gauge your investor interest in investing in this company. And as mentioned earlier, this meeting will be recorded and we will follow up with an email to you copying John and attaching the deck he will be presenting today iLumen has developed a non-invasive neurostimulation treatment to restore vision loss, vision loss resulting from dry age-related macular degeneration. This debilitating disease is the number one cause of blindness in those over the age of 50. And in fact, one out of four people are symptomatic by the age of 60. Unfortunately, there are no FDA-cleared treatments for dry AMD, and this disease affects 110 million people around the world, including 11 million plus here in the U.S. alone. What iLumen does is it provides ophthalmologists and optometrists with an office-based treatment to improve vision to slow the progress of geographic atrophy. The company is currently raising a $3.5 million A round at very attractive terms, two million of which has already been raised. Investors will receive 100% warrant coverage at the same terms as the Series A round, enabling them to double their investment following early clinical validation. And the funds will be used to conduct a clinical study to support FDA clearance. Some other key investment considerations, um, obviously the market is, is huge. Um, the dry AMD market in the US alone is projected to be $50 billion. There are no treatments available for the 11 million people suffering from dry AMD. The company has a clear pathway to acquisition which John will talk about. The leadership team. So iLoom and C-Suite are all proven, highly experienced business professionals. They have a great track record in starting and selling med device companies. Collectively, the team has cleared 16 medical devices through the FDA. So they know what they're doing, obviously. And they've sold five companies with a total acquisition value of about $850 million. The company is also engaged in some conversations about being acquired. Um, most recently, uh, within the ophthalmic industry, the pre-revenue company, the valuation of these companies on a, uh, of these pre-revenue companies have been over three hundred million dollars, and they are in significantly smaller markets than the one in which iLumen is playing. The cap table is composed of uh, very prominent private investors, both some of the highest-profile names in the world of ophthalmology, finance, and leisure. The minimum investment amount is one hundred thousand. The offer is limited and hopefully will be oversubscribed within days of this event. So thank you guys for joining us. And I'd like to now introduce John Valor, the CEO and president of iLumen Scientific. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you, Chen, and welcome, everyone. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you the iLumen technology. Our mission is focused on pioneering the use of surface neurostimulation as an ophthalmic therapeutic to improve vision in those with dry age-related macular degeneration and to slow the progression of geographic atrophy. But ultimately what we're driving towards is restoring the ability for people to see faces again. And let me explain that. Dr. John Jarding, who is the founder scientist and inventor behind this technology, is a trained ophthalmologist who has not only operated his own private practice, but also has worked at the Veterans Administration in Hot Springs, South Dakota. And what he was seeing was a significant increase in the number of patients that presented with dry AMD and the impact that it was making on their lives. Unfortunately, there are no treatments for dry AMD, and that's what drove John to start his work researching and developing hypotheses and ultimately a technology to be able to treat this disease state. Now, dry AMD is the leading cause of blindness in those over the age of 50. It's a progressive disease, and it affects your central field of vision. 
So imagine if you're a patient with AMD and one day you wake up and start to have a cloud in your central field of vision. And within six months to two years, you have a dark spot. So you can no longer see the face of your spouse, your children, or your grandchildren. Unfortunately, one in four people are diagnosed and become symptomatic by the age of 60 with this disease. And ophthalmology's greatest concern is that this disease will lead to geographic atrophy. That's a process where retinal cells complete the process of uh, apoptosis or go through death. And once they die, you can't replace them. So our objective, Dr. Jarding's objective, was to restart the cellular process to be able to regenerate and to treat these cells to slow the progression of this disease. Now, this market is huge, not only from a global perspective, but also from a domestic perspective. Today, more than 110 million people worldwide have AMD. There are two forms of AMD, dry and wet. 85% of the market suffers from dry AMD and there are no treatment solutions. In the US alone, there are more than 14 million sufferers. Today, roughly 2 million have wet AMD. There are treatments for wet AMD. There are anti-VEGF therapeutics that are injected intravitrally every two to six weeks. Currently, that market is a $5 billion market. Dry AMD, there are roughly uh, over 12 million patients with this, and there are no treatment solutions. If we were to penetrate just 40% of this market, it would represent a $14 billion market opportunity, and that's just the U.S. alone. Now, we've developed a low-level microcurrent stimulation that activates various retinal cells. It's a non-invasive, office-based therapeutic that'll be delivered by physicians, ophthalmic techs and optometrists. There are two treatment regimens. Initially, patients will go through a restorative treatment regimen where they'll receive treatment over a five-day period of time. Then they will move to a quarterly maintenance treatment in which they will come in once a quarter to be treated for one day. As you can see from these images, this is a very user-friendly or patient-friendly technology that's applied to the surface of the uh, eye. The most important takeaway here is that almost 80% of patients experience some level of improvement in their vision after just one week of treatment. Now let's talk about the retina. You know, the retina has three primary cell groups within it the retinal pigment epithelium cells, and the Mueller cells. These are support cells that support the neural cells which take in light, process that light, send it to the brain uh, through the optic nerve so that it can create images. The support cells are energy dependent. So we are delivering energy to the support cells to improve the function of the neural cells. More specifically, what we're doing is we're delivering energy to the RPE cells, the retinal pigment epithelium cells, so that they can signal neural protection to the photoreceptors. We're also delivering energy to the Mueller cells so that they can proliferate or multiply, and then they convert themselves into photoreceptor cells or rod and cone cells. Ultimately, this uh, leads to repair and regeneration of the photoreceptor cells, which drives patients towards improved vision. Now, we use a dual waveform, both monophasic and biphasic, to be able to activate these various cell groups. And ultimately, that leads to improving vision and slowing the progression of geographic atrophy. Now, when you step back, there are a number of competitive therapeutics that are driving after this market opportunity. But what you'll notice is that Illumin represents a non-invasive first-line therapeutic. We're not an intravitreal injection, which could cause inflammation and infection. And also, we're not only focused on slowing geographic atrophy, we're focused on improving visual acuity, helping patients restore the vision that they once had. Now, this is a procedure that will be done in the physician office. 
And so physicians will seek reimbursement from Medicare and private insurers for the procedure that they're providing using procedure codes. We are estimating that physicians uh, will be able to generate roughly $3,200 for the five-day restorative treatment regimen. And on an annual basis, assuming patients come in once a quarter for the maintenance treatment, they will generate nearly $2,500 a year in maintaining the visual improvement that those patients generate, as well as maintaining or slowing the growth of geographic atrophy. So how do we make our money? Well, we are selling a single-use disposable electrode kit for each treatment that the physicians do. As a result, this is a razor, razor blade type business. And we understand that uh, and have a very healthy gross margin on our electrode cell sales, as well as the sale of the equipment, which will be a single purchase capital good. Let's talk a little about our IP. The company owns all of the IP that has been developed around this technology. And we have a very broad portfolio of patents that cover us both domestically as well as globally. Our patents have all been granted between uh, 2019 and 22, or 21, excuse me, and have a significant number of claims associated with them. We have a number of other patents that are under development, both domestically as well as internationally. And our patent family really focuses on two areas, treatment method, as well as uh, device design. Now, as it relates to our clinical evidence stack, it's significant. Not only did Dr. Jarding perform a human study and treated 539 eyes, but we also have a number of preclinical or animal studies that have been done using our technology. In addition, we completed a computational modeling exercise this last year so that we could understand where the current was flowing and how much current was flowing to each of the tissue structures within the eye. Now, we measure improvement based on visual acuity or the ability to read letters. Now, let's imagine a patient comes in who has dry MD and they can read the line highlighted in purple, meaning that they have vision that's 2125. With our treatment, what we've been able to demonstrate is that many patients can improve their vision by 10 letters or more. This is the FDA's minimum requirement for FDA clearance. But what Dr. Jarding was able to demonstrate was that there was a portion of that patient population that actually saw a 15 letter improvement in visual acuity and could move from reading the purple line all the way down to reading the line highlighted in green, a significant improvement in visual acuity. Now let's talk a little about the human study that Dr. Jarding uh, performed. As I indicated, he treated 270 patients or 539 eyes. And what he saw was that nearly 50% of patients saw a 10-letter improvement over a five-day period of time, which is significant and a real benefit to these patients. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of preclinical studies or animal studies that have been done, and they all support the use of neurostimulation to improve photoreceptor survival and retinal function. And this is a representation of the computational modeling exercise that we did over the past year. And it, again, allows us to understand where the current is flowing and the amount of current that's being delivered to each of the structures within the eye. It helped us better understand the mechanism of action and why our technology performs so well and so quickly. Now let's talk about the regulatory pathway. It's a low risk process. We've been in touch with the FDA and had two meetings with them to define what the regulatory process will look like over the next 36 to 40 months. And they've indicated that we need to complete a phase one or safety study, which will include 30 patients and we will track them or follow them for 12 months and then a phase two or three efficacy study. 
which will include 100 patients over a 12-month period of time. That will allow us then to file as a class two device under the de novo process. Again, we have this pathway clearly defined and we are uh, planning to engage in this starting February of 2022. As it relates to our uh, financial milestones and liquidity, ev liquidity events, uh, currently we are raising $3.5 million to support the completion of the pilot or safety study. Subsequently, after we complete that, we will do a series B, which will cover both the pivotal study or efficacy study and regulatory clearance. And we'll look to raise $10 million. But we expect to have a potential liquidity event prior to the completion of the pivotal study because FDA will look at 30 day data from those 100 patients in the pivotal study to determine the efficacy of our technology. And that's when we plan to file for FDA clearance. As we look at those who would be interested in acquiring this technology, obviously it'll be an ophthalmic company. We've already initiated conversations with the likes of Alcon and J&J, &J, as well as Bosch and Loam and Zeiss. And as you look at recent industry acquisitions, they have all been pre-revenue and shareholder return has been over a 10X. These just represent some of those acquisitions that have occurred within industry that were all pre-revenue. Now, our management team has extensive experience with surface neurostimulation. We've cleared 16 devices uh, through the FDA, both class two and class three. And this has led to five acquisitions of companies with a total acquisition value of over 850 million. We're also including or have engaged leading luminaries to help guide the scientific development of our technology. These include individuals such as Dr. Sophie Bakri, the chair of ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic, Timothy Jackson, director of retinal research at King's College, and Robert Warner, the former president of the Americas for Alcon. As I indicated earlier, we're looking at completing our Series A2 uh, round, which is a $3.5 million round. We've already raised 2 million, and we are looking to close by the end of this quarter on 1.5 million at very attractive terms. The share price is a dollar per share, and we're also offering 100% warrant coverage so that investors have the opportunity after we release data from the pilot study to double their investment at that initial purchase price of a dollar per share. Now, Illumin represents a clinically de-risked investment opportunity. We have existing data that shows or demonstrates rapid onset of the clinical benefit within five days of the initial treatment. We have practitioners who are seeking a treatment solution because nothing is available. We have key competitive advantages. We're not an intravitreal injection. We're a non-invasive office-based therapeutic that their staff can deliver to these patients. So it represents a incremental revenue stream to them. We have a low risk regulatory pathway. It's a two-step process that in which we can leverage the de novo uh, clearance. And we already have engaged conversations with strategic acquisition partners who are interested in acquiring the technology prior to commercialization. And most importantly, we expect a substantial upside return for our investors between 10 to 12X. I thank you for the time and look forward now to discussing the business and answering any questions that you may have. I will turn it back over to you, Tien. Thank you so much, John. Great presentation. I see we have some questions in the chat box already. Again, if you have any questions, you can either type them directly into the chat box or private message. I've gotten a few private messages already, and you can also raise your hand. But I'll let Skylar uh, Rallison, who will now uh, uh, moderate the Q&A session. Sky? Awesome. Thanks, Tian. Okay. Um, John, our first question is, what is the drop-off in improvement over time that requires the ongoing maintenance treatment? 
Absolutely. Dr. Jarding generally saw in his human study that he performed that patients needed to come in every three to four months for retreatment to maintain the existing visual acuity gains from the uh, restorative treatment regimen. So roughly every three to four months, they need to come back in for retreatment. Okay, awesome. Um, the next question is, uh, your your presentation is quite motivating. Can you review the mechanic or mechanism of the action again and speak to IP production around your energy waveform? Absolutely. Let me go back up to the mechanism of action. So the mechanism of action is really around activating both the retinal pigment epithelium cells as well as the Mueller cells. And we know that there are different waveforms and different frequencies that need to uh, be delivered to activate those uh, specific cells. And so our IP is around uh, the delivery of those uh, specific waveforms and frequencies and the activation that we're creating within those cells. Um, the other side of it is the way in which we're delivering the uh, stimulation to the treatment area with the electrode being applied to the surface of the skin uh, and optimizing the location of both the electrode, the active electrode on the eye, as well as the grounding electrode, which is placed on the back of the neck. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next question is, does this treatment also help people with high myopia as well? You know, that is an area of opportunity that we have explored. We do not have any clinical evidence at this point to support the use of our technology in that area, but that is certainly an area that we could move forward in, uh, given the opportunity or given the benefit of the technology in reducing uh, edema uh, and pressures within the eye, as well as other conditions. But it's not an area that we've studied at this point. Okay, awesome. Um, next question, who are the other major competitors and how is iLumen different or better? How well capitalized are these competitors? A absolutely, very good question. So when you look at the competitive set, and I apologize, I was, I think I must have passed the email uh, or passed the uh, slide. So the competitive set is, is really around uh, two areas. There are devices such as iLumen with our neurostimulation, as well as photobiomodulation, where they're using infrared light to try to activate the cells um, to get the, a similar outcome as to what we're doing. The rest of the uh, therapeutics that are being developed uh, tend to be in the area of using some type of drug formulation to uh, upregulate or downregulate uh, cellular activity. Or in the case of cell therapy, where you are actually injecting stem cells or performing some surgery to replace those lost cells, retinal cells that have gone through apoptosis. Um, so those are uh, very, uh, they're uh, obviously uh, invasive uh, and they have a fairly long development cycle. I think one of the real competitive advantages that we have is that physicians are looking for a non-invasive first-line treatment that they can begin to treat patients as soon as they are diagnosed. They may not be symptomatic, i.e. have vision loss, but they still have the disease and the progression can occur. And the objective is to slow that progression. And so what we have done with our technology or the advantage we have is that most physicians are not going to use an intravitreal injection into the eye uh, when the patient is not symptomatic. Uh, and so that's the real advantage that we have. And therefore, as we go forward, we rep, uh, recognize that we'll be a first-line treatment. Does that answer the question that was raised? I think it does. Um... I will move on to the next one. And if it doesn't, they'll ask a follow-up question, I'm sure. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the next question is from Dan Conley. And I think the first part is a follow-up question saying, which company I live in question mark. Um, but the second part of that is the jarring work was performed 20 years ago. Why can't they repeat what appears to be 
low cost proof. Um, so uh, part of the process is that uh, Dr. Jarding's study was a very good uh, study from the standpoint that it, it provided us with a great signal. What we are now performing uh, with the upcoming two clinical studies is that they are going to be controlled studies where we are uh, treating patients with both active stim and then a, a portion of the patient population will be uh, treated with a sham device. And that gives us a very good comparator between those two groups. And so that's the process that we need to go through to be able to secure FDA clearance. And again, this is a two-step process. We need to be able to demonstrate safety of the technology and then efficacy. I will share with you that our phase one safety study is essentially a, a safety slash efficacy study. Uh, it has all of the efficacy endpoints uh, that we will be performing in the efficacy study so that we have a very good idea as to what the results will be when we do conduct the efficacy study. And hence, therefore, it's a more expensive study because of the number of uh, scans and assessments that we are doing uh, during that initial uh, trial. So again, this, uh, our, our study costs fall in line with what you would typically see in an uh, ophthalmic-based uh, uh, study as it relates to the retina. Okay. Um, the next question says, is there any pain during treatment? So there is no pain. Essentially, what patients will experience while they're being treated is that they will see phosphines in their central field of vision. So if you were to close your eyes now and rub your eyes very hard, you'll see light flashes that occur. And as a result, that indicates that the neurons within those uh, various cell tissues are being activated. And that's essentially what the patients will experience during the treatment. So there is no pain. Uh, and again, this is a non-invasive patient-friendly treatment where the electrodes are applied to the surface of the skin and the patient uh, is delivered or receives this treatment over a 30-minute uh, period of time. Okay, awesome. So that kind of answers the follow-up question of how long is each treatment time and how long is the maintenance time? Sure. The treatment time, uh, the restorative treatment uh, time is the same as the maintenance time. So essentially it's 24 minutes and then we've included six minutes for the clinician to don and doff the surface neurostimulation electrodes. So essentially the patient is in the chair for 30 minutes and treated during that time of which uh, active treatment is 24 minutes. Okay, great. Um, next question is how much has the company raised so far and what are the terms of the raise? Absolutely, we raised a seed round of 1.1 million uh, that was completed in October of 2019 and funded the further development of the technology and the initial uh, progress with the FDA. Uh, subsequently, we uh, raised uh, 2 million at the, during the first quarter of this year against the $3.5 million raise. So, so far in total, we've raised uh, $3.1 million uh, to fund the business. And we're looking to close on an additional 1.5 before the close of this quarter. Okay, um, next question. What will keep the term and founder or the team and founders motivated? Sounds like the offering is very dilutive. Uh, it is not a, a dilutive uh, round, and, and the, uh, both the founders as well as the management team uh, are compensated through um, stock options. And so the drive for us is to get this to a point where we can create a liquidation for the company and be able to uh, benefit from that perspective. So we're highly compensated with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, options uh, which is really driving, uh, if you will, the involvement of the uh, management team and the founders, as well as the board going forward. Great. Okay, next question is, are there existing CPT codes or will new codes be needed? 
Absolutely. So there are no treatments for dry age-related macular degeneration, and therefore there are no CPT codes that exist today. So what we will do is uh, initially we will secure a category three CPT code. We will begin that work in early 2023 before we start the uh, uh, pivotal study so that we have Medicare on board with what we are doing. And what that allows us to do then is do what they call a crosswalk. So we will have a generic CPT code and then we will be able to crosswalk over to existing CPT codes, such as deep brain stimulation, and be able to use the uh, fee schedule associated with those treatments. We will do that for two years. And once we have enough data to demonstrate the amount of time and effort that physicians are putting into this, then we will uh, switch from a category three to a category one code and lock in that uh, fee schedule. This is how uh, technologies, uh, new technologies where there are not existing CPT codes, this is the typical process that they go through. And uh, Medicare is very comfortable with this and uh, has found it very effective way of establishing reimbursement so that technologies such as ours, treating disease states that are underserved can begin uh, uh, generating revenue uh, upon commercialization. Awesome. Um, next question is, can head move during treatment and is the antenna taped to the face and eye? Sure. So um, first of all, yes, the uh, individual can move uh, their head left and right, up and down. Um, the patient remains during the treatment, uh, remains with their eyelids closed. Um, and there is no antenna. We're not transferring anything uh, to the patient. It's all connected via a lead wire. Uh, and as you can see, let me back up here. Uh, as you can see, there is an active electrode that is applied to the eye and then a grounding electrode that is applied to the back of the neck. And that helps bring or drive the current back to the back of the retina. Uh, it is then, as you can see, there's a, a gray lead wire that is then connected to a controller that essentially delivers the stimulation. And just to give you an idea of what the kit looks like that the physicians are using, uh, the controller is the size of an iPad, a uh, iPad mini. So it's uh, uh, very easy for them to move this treatment from room to room so that they can uh, treat patients uh, wherever, whenever within the practice. So again, it's a very user-friendly uh, technology uh, and uh, it allows the patient total uh, freedom to be able to move their head uh, during the uh, 24 minute treatment cycle. Okay. Um, the next question, the first part was already answered, but the second part is why must this be held at a doctor's office? You know, initially uh, we felt after talking with both uh, ophthalmologists, retinologists, and optometrists that they wanted to be able to monitor patients and their progress as the treatment is being delivered. But over time, we recognize that with this specific patient population that already have uh, visual acuity issues and having uh, the ability to walk without assistance can be a challenge. We have designed this so that it could be delivered at home while a clinician or physician is sitting on the other side of a monitor uh, and being able to do remote uh, treatment and remote monitoring of the patient. So yes, we've designed the technology and we actually have IP uh, that we've already secured that would enable us to protect this concept of remote treatment of the patient so that they could be treated while sitting at home with a clinician uh, monitoring them and administering the treatment uh, via a computer. Okay. But initially it will be an office-based treatment. Okay. Um, the next question is, do the patients most often have the dry AMD condition in one or both eyes? 
You know, oftentimes patients present uh, with dry AMD in both eyes, but it can be somewhat uh, sequential versus simultaneously. Generally, what we see is that one eye will be the lead eye and that the second eye will follow within six to 18 months having uh, or becoming symptomatic with uh, dry AMD. So generally they do end up with both eyes being affected. Okay. Um, the next question is what about your patents and provisionals? If you just could go over that one more time. Absolutely. Let me back up to that slide. So essentially we have uh, six patents that have been granted in the US. Uh, and the initial two patents are really the basis of uh, the remaining patents. We do have a second family of patents that have started and that's patent uh, five and six. Um, we have uh, those claims are generally around the way in which the stimulation is delivered to the treatment area, as well as the concept of uh, remote uh, treatment and monitoring of the patients. The next generation of IP that we're developing is around the waveforms that we're using, the frequencies, and the way in which we're activating cells uh, within, uh, within the retina area, uh, as well as some other design elements that we've incorporated into the product. From a glo uh, the global patents are a play off of the US patents, and currently those have been granted in the EU, Canada, Australia, and Japan. So from a patent perspective, we have a very good coverage for our technology as we move forward here. Great, thanks, John. Um, we're gonna continue with the q and I'm gonna launch a poll really quick just to indicate your level of interest in iLumen. Um, and while that is up, we're gonna, we're gonna continue with the Q&A. Um, so the next question is, what are the commercialization plans relative to marketing, sales, manufacturing, and distribution? Absolutely. So from a commercialization perspective, just gonna rotate down. I have a slide on this. So as we look at, um, whoops, as we look at uh, commercialization going forward in the various countries, uh, we expect to be able to begin commercialization uh, of the technology in late 2025, early 2026. And we will start out uh, initially with uh, ophthalmology. So when we think about the pyramid within uh, ophthalmology and optometry, you have retinologists who sit at the top of the pyramid ophthalmologists that sit just below them, and optometry that sits below them. And as a result, we will start out with the ophthalmologists. Retinologists tend to be surgeons. Ophthalmologists tend to be surgeons, as well as uh, uh, delivering or utilizing other non-surgical therapeutics. So that's where we will start in, er, in late 2025. Then we will migrate to multidisciplinary practices where there's both optometry and ophthalmology in the same practice. And then ultimately by the end of 2026, early 2027, we will move into uh, optometry practices. We see that this technology will generally reside within optometry and multidisciplinary practices that include both uh, ophthalmology and optometry. Because today 25 per, or 20% of the patient population sitting in optometry offices are patients that present with dry AMD. And generally they're not referred on to an optometry, excuse me, an ophthalmologist or retinologist until they begin to show signs of geographic atrophy or wet AMD. So that is our strategy as we go forward. And we've already calculated what the revenue stream could be for these various practices. As I indicated earlier, because there are no treatment solutions available today, 
This has been a patient population that physicians could only monitor over time, and they have been unable to treat them. Therefore, once they are given a uh, treatment system such as Illumin, this represents a incremental revenue stream that they themselves can generate or their staff. And it also represents a reoccurring revenue stream because patients will be coming back in on a quarterly basis to receive retreatment. Obviously, we will then look at, as we go forward, seeking uh, 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 regulatory clearance in other countries, such as the UK, Australia, Canada, and Japan. And those will be in later years out. Awesome. Um, next question is, can you talk about the founders, their continued involvement, your background, and how did you get engaged with this company? Absolutely. So my background is that I've got uh, more than 20 years in surface neurostimulation, uh, device development, and commercialization. These represent just a few products that I have developed moved through FDA clearance and commercialized. The one that aligns most closely with what we're doing here at iLumen is the Bionicare product, where we were utilizing microcurrent stimulation to activate or re-energize certain cells within articular cartilage to help regenerate those, or regenerate that cartilage, as well as maintain that cartilage over time. As it relates to Dr. John Jarding, who developed this technology, he remains involved with the Medical Advisory Board, which is inclusive of Dr. Bakri, Dr. Chen, Dr. Kitchens, and Tim Jackson, who have all been instrumental in helping us continue to formulate both the clinical strategy uh, moving forward, as well as the commercialization strategy once we have FDA clearance. So John will remain involved in, and does remain involved with the company. Great. Um, next question is regarding mechanism of action. Is there evidence, maybe imaging, showing retinal cell re regeneration? Absolutely. The area that we see that is in the uh, preclinical work that was done by Dr. Chin and others where they have been able through mice studies to be able to look at both in vitro and in vivo, what's actually happening to the cells within the retina when stimulation is delivered. Obviously, because of testing mechanisms, we could not do that uh, type of work uh, with uh, human cells, but they have been able to demonstrate that by adding stimulation, we're upregulating uh, certain uh, activities within the retinal pigment epithelium cells, as well as the Mueller cells. And more specifically, what they demonstrated, and I'm just going to move to the mechanism of action slide. What they demonstrated was that in the case of the retinal pigment epithelium cells, we're delivering uh, the energy because that it's an energy dependent cell. It does three things. First of all, uh, the retinal pigment epithelium cells maintain a uh, or use energy to maintain a tight juncture between the cells themselves. The second thing is, is that they use that energy to increase uh, the expression of neurotrophic growth factors, such as signaling to the photoreceptor cells, uh, neuroprotection as well as the fact that they are, if you will, uh, they activate or act as the garbage man within the retina. So the photoreceptor cells uh, require a lot of nutrients and produce a lot of byproduct. And it is the job of the retinal pigment epithelium cells to carry away the byproducts that are created by those photoreceptor cells. And when they're not energized enough, they don't function properly, and therefore they don't carry away, first they don't deliver, and then they don't carry away the byproducts that are produced by the photoreceptor cells. And this is what uh, Dr. Chen was able to demonstrate, was by adding the necessary energy to these cells that you're turning them back on and this functionality occurs. In the case of the Mueller cells, uh, she and others have been able to demonstrate 
that by adding the necessary energy to activate those cells, not only do, again, they produce a neurotrophic growth factors that help the ganglion and the bipolar cells, but they also activate the Mueller cells to begin to proliferate, to multiply. And then those cells also go through a conversion process where they turn themselves into either rod or cone cells because the rod and cone cells are much like a mosquito in that uh, they have a very short life and they constantly are being replaced. And if the Mueller cells are not able to replace those uh, cells, uh, those photoreceptor cells, they're not able to function properly. So we understand the mechanism of action, and it's been clearly uh, demonstrated in the preclinical work that's been provided or generated by Dr. Chen and several others in the industry. Great. Um, next question is, how will physicians be trained in the use of the device, and will only specialists be able to administer the treatment? What's great about this technology, and, and just let's back up a, a moment. As we look at the wet AMD market, the reason patients are referred on to an ophthalmologist or a retinologist is because ODs or optometrists cannot uh, perform those treatments, nor can optometrist or excuse me, ophthalmologist staff, such as an ophthalmic tech, cannot perform those injections. Our technology is unique in that it's a surface stimulation technology that's non-invasive. So this can be delivered by optometrists or ophthalmic techs or other uh, administrators within their or on their staff. So this really represents a great opportunity to be able to generate incremental revenue from those staffs and make them much more efficient and productive within a practice. So that's the advantage is that this is not a complicated technology uh, that requires an ophthalmologist or a retinologist to deliver it. But much like uh, when you go into a dental practice, the hygienist will clean your teeth do the exam and provide the exam records to the dentist to review before uh, you leave the dental chair. That's the same thing that will occur with our technology is that the ophthalmic tech or the optometrist will deliver the treatment, do the necessary assessments pre and post, and then the ophthalmologist or retinologist uh, may come in and, and look at those uh, as the patient or prior to the patient exiting the chair. So awesome. Um, the next question is, are there any side effects of the stimulation as it is done at the base of the neck? There are no side effects that we are aware of. Uh, and obviously, uh, Dr. Jarding treated a significant number of patients, 270 patients in his uh, study. And there were no uh, adverse events or significant uh, adverse events that he identified or any side effects. Great. Um, the next question says, you and your team have had prior success developing and selling or licensing your NeuroStim devices with a variety of technologies. Could you review, especially dollars and dates of each device, how much money in and what sort of money out you and your team have great how-to stories? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and happy to go through those in detail. Just to give one example, I was uh, with uh, Rehabilicare or Compex Technologies, and uh, that essentially was the technology that was associated with, uh, go down here. That was associated with uh, uh, both the uh, Bionic Care product and the Vital Stim product. And uh, we ended up selling uh, that company, Compex Technology, which was a publicly traded company under the uh, sign CMPX. Uh, we ended up selling that for 105 million uh, to a competitor within the space and then rolled up under a, a Blackstone roll-up strategy. So again, that was a, a four-year uh, turn for our investors who came in with the new management team and, and grew, that, uh, grew that technology, grew that company, and then uh, exited via acquisition by a competitor. Great. 
Um, next question. Have the potential acquire companies showed interest in this technique slash device as it currently exists, or have they suggested any modifications to better fill their product line? So as it relates to the uh, potential strategic targets that we've spoken to so far, uh, they understand the delivery mechanism of the technology and feel that it would fit nicely within the new category of products that's being created. You know, when you look at ophthalmology, it really comes down to uh, four primary verticals, right? You have uh, diagnostics, you have surgical, uh, you have pharma, and then you have lenses. And there's a new category that's been created over the last four to five, six years, which is office-based therapeutics. You know, if you look at dry eye and other conditions such as that, where they're actually looking for therapeutics that can be delivered in the office to, you know, one, treat uh, conditions that they've not been able to treat previously or bringing in better solutions. But more importantly, looking at ways in which they can uh, increase the uh, revenue stream uh, from this very large office staff that is oftentimes there to uh, work uh, next to the surgeon or the ophthalmologist. So again, uh, the strategics we've talked to feel that our technology fits dead center in that, uh, if you will, office-based therapeutics and really represents the type of products that they're looking to add to their portfolio uh, to be able to one, serve underserved markets, but more importantly, be able to create uh, incremental revenue for these practices uh, that are looking to better utilize their administrative staff. Great. Um, next question is, are the terms of the current $1.5 million raise the same as the $2 million raise in the first quarter of 2021? Absolutely. Uh, this is a, a continuation of the $3.5 million Series A2 raise. So, Yes, the terms are identical to the $2 million that we raised uh, earlier this year. Uh, we took a, a brief hiatus from fundraising because we wanted to complete uh, our FDA uh, IDE uh, so that we could be prepared uh, for our upcoming uh, pilot study. Now that we have completed that exercise, uh, we are looking to close out the remaining portion of the $3.5 million round. So yes, it's identical terms to those that came in earlier this year. Okay. Um, are all the members of the management team full-time or are some part-time? Absolutely. So currently uh, myself and Meredith Monday are full-time employees. You know, I've run uh, three startup companies uh, previously and recognized that once we had developed our product and we had outlined our regulatory strategy, I wanted to mitigate the overhead expense during this very important critical time period where we're conducting clinical studies. So Tuha Duncan and Tracy Henry are consultants to the organization and uh, have developed uh, both their uh, associated processes uh, so that we can continue to operate with them as consultants or migrate them into full-time employees if we need to as we go forward. Awesome. Um, next question, is production of hardware done internally? Is R&D done internally or via a third party? Absolutely. So from an R&D perspective, uh, that is done through Tuha Duncan, who operates a firm in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so it's U.S.-based. And from a uh, device perspective, we uh, have uh, used an off-the-shelf stimulator so that we could keep our overhead costs low, and we modified the software. The software was developed here in the States. As it relates to the electro design, again, that is developed here in the States, uh, and we are using an offshore manufacturer at this time to produce the electrodes. So again, we retain all of the proprietary development here in the States, 
and the production is either done with the device here in the States or in the case of the electrode, we're using an offshore manufacturer for the electrode. Great. Um, what is your number of full-time employees? Number of full-time employees is two full-time employees, myself and Meredith Monday. Okay. Um, are there any side effects from this treatment, say six months or 12 months down the road? We have not seen any side effects, uh, or at least Dr. Jarding did not see any side effects uh, from the patients that he continued to treat for up to three and a half years. Okay. Um, what happens if someone drops the maintenance treatment over the extended period of time? If patients uh, uh, discontinue the maintenance treatments, uh, they're likely to see a degradation uh, in their visual acuity, i.e. the haze will come back into their central field of vision uh, and uh, or the uh, geographic atrophy may continue to progress. So if patients would move from, if they did not main the t uh, maintain the treatments, they would continue to go through this staging of GA where you begin to see more and more apoptosis occurring within the retinal cells, migrating them towards advanced GA. Okay, um, next question is, a $3.5 million raise on a $12.6 million post is 28% ownership. What does this look like if all issued options slash warrants are exercised at the end of this round? Yes, so that is, um, uh, that is uh, inclusive. That's fully diluted with the uh, options that have been, uh, that have been um, uh, dispensed so far. So that's okay, full, the, the numbers report, reporting are fully diluted. Okay. Um, the next question is, you've had discussions with FDA, any with Medicare or insurance firms? Uh, we have not initiated uh, conversations with uh, Medicare or insurance, uh, private insurance, uh, but we have worked with uh, two uh, agencies, uh, uh, reimbursement uh, groups, uh, one which sits on the coding uh, group for uh, Medicare. Uh, so we feel very confident and comfortable with the reimbursement strategy that we've outlined and expect to be able to secure uh, support from Medicare uh, for this uh, underserved disease state, uh, given the uh, back-end cost structure. Remember, patients migrate from dry AMD to wet AMD. The wet AMD market, is a, the treatments are very expensive. Uh, currently, you're looking at uh, between $900 to $1,200 per shot. Uh, so, it, and those are happening every two to six weeks. So that's a significant uh, expense to Medicare. If they can reduce that to the point where, again, um, you know, they're spending significantly less with a non-invasive treatment that limits the potential for infection uh, or the potential for ocular edema, uh, certainly they're going to support uh, that type of, uh, type of treatment going forward. So we represent a, uh, if you will, um, a cost savings and mitigating, uh, potentially mitigating the, the possibility that patients move into uh, a wet status, which becomes very complicated to treat and very expensive. Okay. Um, Michael has a list of several questions, so I'll go through them uh, one by one instead of asking them all together. Um, so the first one is, what are the patent expire dates? Uh, so most of the patents were just granted in the last uh, two to three years. Uh, so we've got uh, 15 plus years on those patents. Okay. Um, does the inventor have prior art on this and and is it assigned to the company? Uh, yes, all uh, uh, prior art has been assigned to the company and the company owns that. There is no other prior art uh, that is owned by any uh, external party other than the company. Okay. 
Um, what is the cost of the equipment to the practitioners? Absolutely. So from the standpoint of the device itself, uh, that is a capital good purchase and the pricing is $15,000 for the device itself. And it has a five year uh, support uh, that goes along with it. Uh, the electrode kit, which includes the grounding electrode and the active electrode uh, is being sold at $150 per treatment. Okay. Um, it says, I assume the revenue of the practitioners excludes the payment to the company for disposables. Is this correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, are you investing in this round? If not, why not? Uh, so I uh, have invested uh, previously uh, and uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, investing going forward, obviously I will, I will continue to consider that in uh, future rounds. Okay. Um, now this is a new question from someone else saying, when you say carry away the waste of the rod and cones, is that drusen? I might mispronounce that. D-R-U-S-E-N. Um, yep, you, you pronounced it okay. correctly. Okay, Very awesome. good. <laughs> so uh, essentially the rod and cone cells, just to back up here. So the rod and cone cells throw off small discs. And also the rod and cone cells go through a natural apoptosis where they're constantly being uh, replaced. So that's what the uh, RPE is designed to do, is to carry away uh, those discs uh, as well as the spent rod and cone cells themselves. As it relates to drusen, drusen does over time uh, is, is uh, reduced in size and carried away. We do not, we have not yet measured that uh, and did not measure that in Dr. Jarding's original study. So until we complete the next two studies, I can only speak to how the technology works. Obviously, we'll monitor that or assess that uh, during both the pilot and the pivotal study to be able to uh, look at that as, a, uh, as an additional mechanism of action uh, for ILUMIN. Okay. Um, next one is, can you MD consider the treatments immediately after diagnosis or would there be other treatments slash procedures applied first? Absolutely. So uh, what we see going forward is that as soon as a patient is diagnosed with uh, dry AMD, they would begin to uh, receive treatment so that you could one, slow or stop the progression of the disease as soon as possible. What we do not want is we don't want to wait until patients begin to see a haze or they begin to have geographic atrophy that's occurring. We want to stop it as soon as they are diagnosed. And oftentimes, uh, drusen is one way in which they uh, are able to monitor the progress of patients as they're going through uh, the various stages of AMD, i.e., the drusen will move from very small. Uh, hard uh, uh, size and move to a, a much larger confluent size. And so what you want to do is mitigate that whole process. And so you would start treatment as soon as the patient was diagnosed and continue to accept, uh, assess that patient to determine the frequency in which retreatment is required. Not all patients are going to need to come back in on a quarterly basis. Uh, those patients that did come back in on a quarterly basis in Dr. Jarding's study were typically patients who had already had uh, a deterioration in vision or had some level of geographic atrophy. So again, the idea is for a patient who is not symptomatic, uh, you would initiate the treatment and you may be able to extend the period of retreatment out uh, based on the fact that uh, the disease is not progressing. That's not an area that we have looked at because, again, uh, from an FDA perspective, we need to treat patients who are already symptomatic to be able to demonstrate an improvement in vision to be able to get FDA clearance uh, for the technology. 
Great. Um, I'm going to ask the last three questions. And then if anyone has any further questions after that, feel free to stay on. Um, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. Um, so we'll go through these last three. Um, it says, do you have a manufacturer lined up to produce the equipment and the disposables and how firm are you on the production costs? Uh, we are, we do have uh, manufacturers uh, that we've outsourced this to lined up uh, and they have produced uh, initial quantities that are being used in the upcoming clinical study, which starts in February of 2022. And we have a very a uh, good understanding of cost structure for both the device, the lead wire or headset, as well as the uh, electrodes. So we are uh, very comfortable uh, and confident with the pricing and, and obviously expect that to go down as we begin uh, to uh, uh, produce larger quantities for commercialization. Okay. Um, next question is, what is the real IP here? What keeps a company overseas from copying this and marketing it in markets outside of the U.S. or even within the U.S.? Of course, you can litigate, but that takes a lot of money and time. Sure. And, you know, patents are only worth uh, their, their value if you're willing to fight uh, to maintain your uh, proprietary technology. And so obviously we've gone after what we think are the largest market opportunities for the technology going forward and in markets where we know uh, that if uh, someone does, uh, if you will, uh, invade on our IP, that we can uh, uh, have an opportunity to uh, secure a protection against it. Um, so from the standpoint of what is our IP, it's around the way in which we deliver stimulation to the treatment area. And then uh, obviously uh, the other areas that we're looking at are the way in which we're using stimulation at uh, uh, using certain waveforms and frequencies, uh, as well as the activation of certain uh, cellular activities within the retinal cells themselves. So uh, I hope that gives you a good idea. Obviously, if you're willing to uh, sign a non-disclosure agreement, we're willing to share more about our IP and uh, what we've been able to protect and what we're in the process of securing uh, from a protection standpoint as we go forward. Okay, um, last question before we can end the meeting for those who need to leave. Um, and then if you have further questions, please feel free to stay on. But are there any retina photos post ilumin treatment? Uh, we do not have any retinal photos at this time. Obviously, as part of our pilot study and our pivotal study, uh, we are using a variety of different assessments to be able to give that to or generate that for us. Uh, most importantly, we'll be using a multifocal ERG as we go forward. Uh, to be able to demonstrate uh, uh, to demonstrate the benefit of the technology. Okay, awesome. Um, John, thank you so much for this. This has been awesome. I know there's another question from Michael. So if Michael, if you want to stay on, we can definitely um, address that. Or, and anyone else, if you have any more questions, please feel free to stay on. Um, but we know it's about 10 minutes over. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we will be in touch with you later with the details from today's event. Skylar, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today, and I look forward uh, to answering any additional questions that you may have. But more importantly, I will be pushing out an email uh, later today inviting, to, uh, inviting you to uh, participate in additional uh, Zoom calls to be able to review the technology our business strategy and so forth uh, at greater length if you would like to. But please feel free to reach out to me at any time. And I look forward to uh, talking with you further about this uh, unique and de-risked uh, investment opportunity. Thank you so much, John. Um, so we'll just go over the last couple questions. If, if Does that work, John? You have the time for Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. So uh, Michael was wondering, he says, have you lined up or retained a firm such as Kirkland and Ellis to be ready to be ready to defend your patents? Is that firm involved in a review of your IP to ensure 
def- defensibility. A- absolutely. We are using a, a law firm uh, by the name of uh, Lemaire and Associates, which is based in Minneapolis, who does have experience with surface neurostimulation uh, technology uh, and uh, can not only develop, but litigate if necessary, our IP as we go forward. Uh, so we do feel uh, comfortable with that. Uh, we also have our corporate attorney is from Fox Rothschild, and they also have um, looked at our uh, patent uh, portfolio as well. So we do have a dual representation uh, if required as we go forward. Okay, awesome. Um, I believe that that's the last question in the chat. If anyone else has any more questions, please feel free to unmute um, and ask John yourself right now. Um Otherwise, we can end the meeting if there's no more questions. We're going to send out a link to the recording anyway, so you guys can go through and, and uh, review again. And um, if I you think have any that Michael has a question as well. I okay. think he's going to unmute. Hey, John, I, I didn't want to write it again because I think you've answered it, but I'm still confused. So... On your current raise, so it's under the same terms as your first million of the three and a half. And the three and a half, when you raise it at a dollar a share with a valuation post money of 12 million. Did I read that correctly? That's correct. So that's about 30% uh, dilution. Oops. Yes. So that you're giving away 30% of the company and then you're giving warrants for another 30% of the company. Yeah, so uh, maybe the best thing to do with what so I'm just thinking about it. It sounds to me like you're giving away like 60% of the company on this round. Uh, no, we're uh, essentially, uh, and I've got a table here that provides a good overview of that. So essentially, what we end up giving away uh, in this round is 28% to the Series A, right? Two. And then that once we, and, and then once we, do the warrants, uh, they pick up uh, an additional uh, 22%. So it ends up at yeah. 44% in total. Okay. So I'm uh, sorry, I, I forgot about, you got to put in the extra 350 to three and a half yep. million to get there. So yes. You're, so you're giving away 44% of the company in this we round. Are. And we then are. your yours and the management team, you have equity from your prior investments plus some warrants. Do I, or... Uh, we have options. a combination. Sorry, yes. So common shares and options uh, were granted to founders and uh, current board man, uh, current board members and management. Okay. And, and, so, and other consultants. So are they, are you issuing additional options as you go forward um, to, uh, per, to reduce that dilution impact or? Uh, we do. Uh, we do have options going forward that are granted uh, based on performance, not just on maintaining uh, or overcoming dilution. So uh, obviously, as you see, the founders will be diluted along with the board members and management uh, over time. Uh, but based on hitting uh, specific milestones, there are opportunities uh, to improve uh, option position as we go forward. Okay. And then of the um, initial founders and investors, um, you raised up, I think you said a million dollars, million one? Uh, no, in our uh, Series A1, uh, we raised 1.1 1. Uh, 1 million uh, from, right. uh, and, and that included essentially uh, 12 investors. I'm sorry, uh, uh, 10 investors. Okay. And that, and that basically, your Series A1 was not your initial capital, to, uh, basically your true venture angel investors, right? That's correct. So did you have additional capital from a- angel investors, which would be, I assume, your founders? Uh, we had a nominal amount uh, that came in in the beginning. Uh, originally, we had uh, uh, some debt, uh, which I cleaned up uh, after we did the Series A1 round, uh, the, okay. the seed round. Okay, so the A1 is kind of a little mix of Pay back some debt, and so a little bit of so, so, pseudo venture. It, it's pseudo venture, yes. 
And then of your A1, what percent of the A1 is investing in this round? Uh, we had uh, uh, three members of the A1 that are investing in this round. Okay, because it seems like a pretty good size dilution percent. Uh, I guess I've done this before, so I would have I would have probably been one of the ones to protect my interest if I was really believed in it. So I was just trying to figure out. I try and gauge the perspective of if you have money, how are you protecting your investment? Yeah. So in our uh, in our uh, seed or Series A one round, uh, essentially we had uh, uh, five primary investors come in. Uh, one at uh, half million. Uh, one at uh, just under two hundred thousand, and then the remaining came in at a hundred thousand each. Um, so that that made up a majority of that round. Uh, three of those individuals, uh, one is already uh, invested in the. Two million. He is part of the two million dollar raise earlier this right. year, and the other two are looking to come in uh, before the close of this year uh, with an additional uh, to participate in this uh, uh, A two round. So okay, the then. larger the larger investor has not yet uh, made a, a move or a decision yet as to whether he's going to come in or not. Okay. Well, that. that you, well, your prior answer wasn't quite as clear on that one, so that's, I apologize that's for that. Okay, thank you. I'm glad I was able to clarify and thank you for raising the question. Thank you for hosting. Absolutely. Um, are there any more questions from anyone who want to unmute? Okay. I think uh, we are. Sorry, last question, Skylar. Oh, yeah. 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 Do you have any debt on your balance sheet at this point? Uh, we do not uh, have any uh, debt uh, that we're carrying from investors. Uh, obviously, we uh, do have some uh, nominal operation debt that uh, we're paying down over time. Thank you. Since I'm unmuted, I have one last question. On, on the disposables, is all the tooling made or do, would you have to do that? Um... We've already made all the tooling, so that, uh, that is all done. Okay. And the, uh, again, Michael, um, as it relates to the device itself, um, the device it was an off-the-shelf stimulator uh, yeah. that allowed me to very, you know, easily adapt the software. Um, it's probably overkill for what we need, uh, but uh, I did not have to go into development. Uh, and the second thing is, is that the device itself has been FDA cleared uh, for uh, 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 delivering microstim current, uh, which is what we use. So again, there was a benefit to using a device that had already been through the FDA and obviously had the quality uh, background uh, and approval, uh, which uh, mitigated uh, any issues with the FDA from a testing perspective going forward. So you kind of have three levels of margin, right? You have the margin on the device. So you're selling it for 15000 and I find it hard to believe that it costs you $15,000 to buy that. <laughs> uh, two is um, you have the $150 per treatment for the cabling, et cetera. So it sounds to me like- Actually, the electrode kit right here, yes. Okay. And does that include the disposable? Uh, yep. So the electrode kit itself is essentially two electrodes. Uh, and that is the disposable kit. The lead wire and earpiece uh, right now are being treated as part of the device and are a maintenance component that uh, we cover uh, for the clinicians going for, or for the physicians, the practices going forward. You said you make $1,500 on your five-day treatment, but you're charging $150 per treatment on the disposables. So... How did yep. it get five times 150? How did it get to $1,500? Yep. 10 treatments delivered over five days. Okay. All right. So that gets... And I assume you can't reuse the, the treatment. So if I came in and I said, okay, I'm just going to save it till the afternoon, does it not work twice or... So essentially part of our IP is that we've developed, uh, we will be putting a chip into each electrode so that uh, once it's been used, it's become spent 
and it can't be used again because the chip indicates that it's already been uh, used on a patient. So we mitigate issues with cross-contamination or reuse on the same patient by including that chip into the uh, electrode itself. Okay, good. We, we will not be incorporating that obviously into the clinical study uh, because that's a controlled environment, but that's a capability. And, and to answer your question about the device itself, a uh, very fascinating aspect on the device. You know, we initially took the device out and tested it uh, from a pricing perspective with practices. And what we found was that uh, we were, we proposed a $5,000 price point for the device as a piece of capital equipment. And we got a lukewarm response. And so one of the physicians suggested to us that if we were to raise the price to 15,000, it would seem more in line with the other equipment that they're used to purchasing. And so as a result, um, we adjusted the price, went back out, did a market test on pricing, and all of a sudden it seemed to raise the validation of the device, even though we had done nothing except raise the price. It now all of a sudden it seemed to be more accepted, like, while wow, this is a technology that works because the cost structure around it is in line with what we purchase other equipment for, <laughs> which, which I found fascinating. So uh, it's, you know, this is really a razor, razor blade business. Uh, the, the controller itself is not expensive for us to manufacture. Um, and, and really, this is all about getting, the, uh, getting patients to come in and get on the treatment loop so that we can uh, distribute uh, the electrode kit. Okay. That's where, that's where the money opportunity is because of the high gross margins. We have uh, higher than 90% gross margins on the electrode kit. Right. Good. Terrific. Any last questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, especially the diehards who stayed till the end. Uh, we will be sending out an email with a copy to John, obviously, so you guys can directly contact him as well as the copy of the deck and a link to the uh, recording. So uh, with that, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, if you have further questions, you will know how to get a hold of John. And um, hopefully we can uh, keep the dialogue moving. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. you.